and welcome to From the EBPL Archives, encore presentations from the East Brunswick Public Library. I am your host, Melissa Hozik. This event was graciously funded by the East Brunswick Friends of the Library. To learn more about the Friends or make a donation, visit ebpl.org forward slash friends. Now, enjoy the program. Hi, good evening. I'm Melissa Kuzma, director of the East Brunswick Public Library. I wanna thank you for joining us for tonight's program, Embracing Our Diversity, Coming Together Against Bias. The East Brunswick Public Library is committed to celebrating our town's diversity and facilitating conversations on the important issues that are being faced in our community and throughout the country. Some of our previous programs included the World Cafe fostering community and a screening of a screening and discussion of the documentary American Creed. We are proud to co-sponsor the program this evening with the East Brunswick Hadassah and the East Brunswick Human Relations oh. Council. So as you can see on the screen, this program is closed captions and you can find the link in the uh, Facebook Live comments. So I'd like to introduce Christine Sullivan, co-president of East Brunswick Hadassah and chair of the planning committee for tonight's event. Can you all hear me? Hi, thank you, Melissa. And thank you so much for joining our forum on embracing our diversity and coming together against violence. Excuse me. Hello. You are part of the conversation tonight. Our program was a year in the planning. Our first concern was the rise of anti-Semitism. It was up over 70%. But then we looked around at others suffering from bias, African-Americans, Muslims, Asians, Christians, and the LGBTQ community. Why? because we fear what we do not know. Did you know that in East Brunswick, 46 different languages are being spoken? Our panelists tonight are from some of the most beautiful and diverse communities in East Brunswick. Our focus tonight begins a discussion of who we are, how we got here, and how we can come together against bias. On your screen, you will see the East Brunswick chapter of Hadassah's activities. Please note our Facebook pages and our website. We are very grateful to the efforts of the East Brunswick Human Relations Council, the East Brunswick Library, Mayor Cohen for their generous help and their support for this great discussion tonight. We are delighted to have East Brunswick Mayor Brad Cohen give words of welcome. Mayor Cohen. Thank you, Christine. First of all, I wanna thank both Hadassah, the East Brunswick Public Library, and of course the Human Relations Council for putting this program, very important program on tonight. On June 10th, 1963, John F. Kennedy addressed the graduates at American University and his words were, if we cannot end now our differences, at least we can help make the world safe for diversity. For in the final analysis, our most basic common link is that we all inhabit this planet. We all breathe the same air. We all treasure our children's future and we are all mortal. Our diversity in East Brunswick has actually always uh, been one, what I believe, of one of our core strengths. People move here for many reasons. They move here clearly for our superior public education system. They move here for our great location, which is a blessing. Uh, they move here for the safety of our uh, community. But I would argue that equal among all of the reasons to move here is our diversity. Um, and I've been asked to provide some statistics on East Brunswick so that that can be used as a backdrop for tonight's uh, discussion. 
racially, and this all comes from uh, census data, which periodically does get updated. So clearly we all know that the census is being compiled right now, but our racial mix is 60% white, 25% Asian, 4% African-American, 9% Hispanic, and 2% mixed. The average income for East Brunswick residents is $111,000 which makes us a fairly affluent town. The most common uh, uh, sources of employment, education, professionals, uh, meaning doctors, lawyers, accountants, healthcare, retail, manufacturing, finance, and IT, um, which is sign of a healthy community that we're not uh, in one core business, but spread out among many. 33.6% uh, of East Brunswick residents are foreign born. As was mentioned earlier, there's about 50 languages that are spoken in our English as a second language program that's provided by our public schools. The most common, the top two languages are Arabic as number one and Chinese number two, followed by Spanish, Urdu, Gujarati, Russian, Korean, and then there's a big drop off after that with the, with the remaining um, 50 of different languages. 38.1% of households in East Brunswick speak a language other than English. Uh, and this is all going to be updated as our 2020 census data finally becomes available. Uh, East Brunswick, for most of you, uh, is a bellwether town. Most politicians, most studies, most surveys look to results in East Brunswick because we're considered uh, basically a bellwether for the entire state of New Jersey. Our boards, commissions, councils in town are filled with representatives of every group. Uh, that was one of my promises when I ran for office four years ago. Um, it was a, the idea that in order to make the town um, representative and for our vision to be truly reflective of everybody that lives here, everybody needs to be offered a seat at the table. And it's not fair for us to believe that a group or a individual or a um, organization doesn't want to be part. The role of a good leader is to reach out and bring those people to the table. And when we've done that, uh, people have responded. And I think an example of the strength of our diversity came during this past lockdown during the pandemic. There was an incredible outpouring of volunteerism from every corner of our uh, township. Um, we had donations, food drives, delivery programs, volunteerism, donations of PPE, virtual programming, support for local businesses, and of course, support for the public schools. And they came from every corner of our community. So I think that we've only begun to see the dividends of our inclusion. And I think that it only goes to show you that we really are truly greater than the sum of our parts. So I hope everybody has an enjoyable evening tonight, learns a lot, contributes, and I thank you from the bottom of my heart for including me and for doing this program, um, which is so important, especially at this time in our uh, history as Americans. So thank you very much. I wanna pass it back then to Christine. Thank you, Mayor Cohen. Our lecturer, our moderator tonight is Nancy Cronick, who is a lecturer at the Rutgers University School of Communication and Information, where she teaches a course in community engagement and other courses. Nancy serves as special projects librarian for the Rutgers University Libraries. She has been president of the American Library Association from 2000 to 2001. And she trained as a public innovator with the Harwood Institute of Public Innovation as convener and moderator for deliberative public forums. Turning over the program to you now, Nancy and the panel. Great, thank you so much, uh, Melissa, Chris, and Mayor Cohen. I'm just delighted to join you tonight for what promises to be a thought-provoking conversation with your neighbors here in East Brunswick. Uh, those neighbors have come together to talk about their aspirations and concerns for their community and to generate ideas on how to embrace community diversity and come together against bias in East Brunswick. 
This conversation offers everyone on the panel and also those of you participating on Facebook Live an opportunity to listen to the experiences of others, think about your own, reflect with others about the aspirations and struggles of your life in East Brunswick, and consider ways to move forward together across the community. So a few words first about the conversation. People on the panel and on Facebook are here to listen and to learn. We're all here for that purpose. Our goal is to understand how people who reside in this community see local issues around diversity, inclusion, and bias in East Brunswick. No specific outcomes are promised from this conversation, but Hadassah and other partners are eager to share what is learned tonight and how to use it to move forward. We're gonna have some note takers to record the conversation. The notes won't include anyone's name or be made public. They are to make sure we're able to learn from this conversation and we'll theme them along with comments and contributions submitted by community members on Facebook Live. So here's the ground rules for our discussion before we begin. Um, so we urge everyone and that's everyone on the panel, but also on Facebook Live to participate and to listen to one another, to keep an open mind, to help ensure this is a respectful space for all, to maintain a dis an atmosphere for discussion, and it's uh, fine and okay to disagree, but not to be disagreeable. So let's keep an open mind as we go through this. So I assume everybody's okay with these ground rules. If you wanna add any, you can uh, put them in the chat. Uh, but keep in mind as we, as we proceed tonight, there is no such thing as a right answer to any of the questions I'm going to pose. We ask you to draw on your own experiences, views and beliefs. Uh, you're not here as an expert, you're here just to represent your own thoughts and feelings. So what's my role? So I'm here to keep the conversation going, call on different people to contribute, probe occasionally for clarity and remain neutral. I'm not a member of the East Brunswick community, which means I have no personal stake in the discussion. I'm here to help you get to know each other better find common aspirations and concerns, and identify possible actions to take in the future. So let's get started. I wanna begin by asking each of our panelists to introduce themselves. I'm not gonna introduce them, they're gonna introduce themselves to you. And I will call on them as they show up on my Zoom. Um, screen, that doesn't mean they're gonna show up on everybody's Zoom screen the same way. So what I want you to do is please tell us your first name, your affiliation, and what brought you and your family to East Brunswick. For those of you who are turning, tuning in on Facebook Live, please do the same. We wanna know who you are and what brought you here as well. Introduce yourselves by first name and tell us what brought you and your family to East Brunswick. Um, and on Facebook, we're encouraging you to conduct a similar conversation that we're having with the panel all along the way um, so that we will hear from a much broader group than just the people on our panel tonight. So uh, now we will begin by asking Dan to start. Hi, uh, good evening, everybody. Uh, thank you uh, for having me here. Uh, my name is Dan Rosette. Uh, I am in East Brunswick uh, five years now. Uh, I am originally from Highland Park, but I lived uh, in Israel for 20 years and recently returned here in 2015. Um, I returned to East Brunswick uh, for several reasons. Uh, one, uh, because I have family here. Uh, two, uh, since my uh, children are, are native Hebrew speakers, the Hebrew charter school uh, was very attractive uh, to us. Uh, and we thought it would be an easier transition for our children uh, from Israel to the United States, uh, and it was. Um, and also there is a vibrant Jewish community here um, from all levels of uh, religious observance, observance and uh, denominations. Uh, so it uh, fit 
uh, our lifestyle uh, very well. Uh, just very quickly, I am uh, I work for the Jewish Federation, uh, which is right across from 18 in South River. So everything just kind of worked out nicely for me as far as uh, location. Um, uh, but I am here as Dan Rosette, and I, I just want to make that clear that I'm, I'm not here necessarily as a Jewish Federation representative. Um, that's it for now. Thank you. Great. So, Naveen. Hi, uh, my name is Naveen. Um, I'm a member of St. Mary's Coptic Orthodox Church. I've been a member uh, for as long as I can remember since moving to America in 2005. Um, I am a graduate student at the Rutgers School of Public Health, so I'm familiar with Rutgers, and um, I moved along with my family to East Brunswick because of the school system, for one, and because of the Coptic community uh, that is present here. Um, we think community and family is really important, so it was really important to us that um, we live near a church and uh, we are a part of that type of community. Mohammed. Sure. Good evening, everybody. Uh, my name is Mohammed Hashmi, and uh, I've been a resident of East Brunswick for the past 16 years. I moved uh, to U.S. Uh, about 30 years ago, and all I know is New Jersey, uh, Edison, and East Brunswick. Happy to be here. Love the town. Um, have interacted with, with most of the folks in the town. I'm involved with the Islamic Center of East Brunswick, right in the heart of East Brunswick. I also play other roles for my community. I'm involved in social, um, civic, and political activities. Also involved heavily religiously uh, with the town of East Brunswick. And I'm here to learn and contribute as best as, as I can. Thank you. Uh, Kam Liu. Yes, my name is Kam Liu and uh, I belong to the Sindhi Hindu religious community. Uh, I migrated to U.S. in 1981, and uh, in 1984, we, uh, my brothers, family, and my mom, uh, we, my, we came to East Brunswick because of the school system, and uh, we like it very much here. It's very safe, and uh, neighbors are very friendly, and uh, I belong to... Uh, Nonprofit organization uh, called Agrat Seva Kendra, which uh, helps in uh, assimilating South Asian community in New Jersey. And uh, also, I am a volunteer member of East Brunswick Water Advisory Committee. And in my free time, I volunteer my time for cooking and serving meals in Elijah's Promise Soup Kitchen in New Brunswick. Neha. Hi, I'm Neha. I'm a freshman at Rutgers Business School. I'm studying business and political science. And um, I went to high school in East Brunswick where I was very involved in the LGBTQ plus community. Um, my parents moved to East Brunswick when I was five years old. So I've lived here for, eight, for 13 years, um, primarily for the school system, but also because the diversity actually, the diversity of East Brunswick was very attractive to them. And um, I'm also very grateful for that. So I'm here, glad to be here. Thank you for having me. Sure. Christy. Hi, everyone. Uh, my name is Christy Adams, and um, I'm currently uh, a chaplain and diversity director of diversity at um, the Hill School in Pennsylvania, but um, grew up in East Brunswick. My family is still in East Brunswick. Uh, what brought my family, um, I was eight years old when, um, when we came. Um, they were, we were working in New York, so we were part of that great migration of people that wanted to move to the suburbs from New York. Um, I have watched East Brunswick um, grow more diverse as the years have gone on. I've seen East Brunswick change quite a bit um, from when I was growing up in the early 90s. Um, I'm also uh, was ordained at a church in Somerset, New Jersey, First Baptist Church of Lincoln Gardens, and I'm still pretty active there from time to time. Um, my mom's texting me about cupcakes right now. So speaking of East Brunswick, that's where she is. Um, and uh, I started a conference that I still work with a group of high school girls from New Jersey, from Central Jersey area called Becoming Conference for Young Black Girls. Um, and that's it. And finally, Susanna. 
All right. Of course, I have to figure out how to unmute myself. Hi, I'm Susanna Chu, and uh, we, I emigrated here from Hong Kong uh, when I was two. My family uh, is originally from China. And uh, as far as what brought us to East Brunswick, it seems like a pretty common theme here, family and the school systems. Uh, so we had family here in town, and we, um, as we were, as as we were starting to grow, our family wanted to be near family, um, and that's hugely important to us. And we've been uh, so pleased with the choice of of where we chose to raise our kids. Um, great school system, great community, um, and uh, you know, just just you know, offering um, a diversity that. And, and um, you know, just the perspectives that I think uh, provides the kids with a great foundation. So um, I'm also, uh, you know, but, so I work full time um, in the energy industry. Um, but, you know, what I, I've always wanted to do, you know, through my life is, you know, volunteer, help where I can, um, you know, working in a range of organizations from uh, providing literacy support uh, through, you know, uh, volunteering at the Chinese schools and finally um, Human Relations Council and um, currently on the school board. So I'm here to speak as a community member, not as a member of any particular organization. And thank you for having me here today. Great. So, so welcome, everybody. Um, now we're going to begin our official conversation. Uh, panelists, please jump in when you feel you want to contribute. If you wave your hand, I'll make sure to acknowledge your turn and cue you up if necessary. So don't uh, forget to turn on your mic when you speak, and it's probably a good idea to turn it off when you're not speaking. So let's get going with our first converse, uh, first question in the conversation. When it comes to diversity and inclusion in East Brunswick, what do you want for you, your family, and your community? Dan, okay, go ahead. I'll go first. Um, I think it's very simple, actually. Um, I just need everybody to see everyone else as human beings. Um, and I think once we uh, start with that, everything, uh, everything uh, that uh, is uh, different about one another will just kind of fall into place and we can uh, talk about it um, as humans. Um, we don't have to uh, judge uh, any one of us by the way we look, speak, uh, or uh, practice uh, religion. Um, once that happens, once we see each other human as humans, everything else I believe is is uh, is downhill. Downhill meaning easy. It's easier from there. No uphill battle. Susanna. And um, I and I agree with everything that that Dan says. And I wanted to add. You know, I really want people to um, to have an open mind and be interested in learning every day. And that's one of the things I've valued about all the, all the organizations that I've worked with over the years have provided me with different perspectives, hearing from people who, uh, for example, when I was volunteering in literacy, people who were born and raised here, but who could not read or write English and the challenges that they face. So keeping an open mind and understanding that everybody faces their own challenges, don't be so quick to judge. Who wants to jump in next? So I would say that um, I think that the, um, for me, it's always the young people just because that's sort of where my heart is. And I really want for, um, young people, particularly young people of color, that identifies people of color, um, students of color, to be able to have um, uh, elementary, junior high, high school experiences where they feel uh, not just welcome, but affirmed, that they feel safe, that safe spaces wouldn't be relegated to isolated spaces, but that they can like walk into the school and feel like it's a safe space regardless. Go ahead. No. I very much agree with what Christy just said, and um, I would say I want that for my community too, as the LGBTQ plus community in general, and um, very much in America, has 
often been um, subjugated and found their safe spaces only within members of their own communities. And I would love to see greater visibility and greater respect um, so that everywhere can be a safe space. And why is that important to you, Nahil? Um, I feel that as much as we can affirm our own identities, there's a different experience when other people see you, as Dan said, as human and see your rights with respect and um, treat you that way. And I, I'd love to see that um, because I just think people deserve it. Let's see, who wanted to go next? Was it Mohammed? I think Naveen raised her hand. Oh, okay. It's okay. You can go ahead. I can go after. Okay. So I think I agree with what Dan and Susanna and Neha said, I think, and also Christy. Um, I think um, inclusiveness has to be on all levels. Um, I think youth primarily more important so than um, adults. So I think um, being safe and being inclusive in schools on all levels is important for, for our community. Uh, being, uh, you know, being safe when we go out and being welcome when we see each other uh, is a part of it. And I try to practice it to the best of my ability where I live. And, you know, it all starts from us. I think um, we, we all need to do, uh, you know, uh, uh, play our role in being inclusive and being accepting of, you know, all, all who are around us. Thank you. Navinga, jump in. Hi, so um, I completely agree with everything that everyone has said. And something I would just like to add to it is this idea of um, that we may not necessarily agree on everything, but it doesn't mean that we have to treat each other um, in a disrespectful way. I think that having a conversation and being kind to one another, hearing what the other sides have to say and their viewpoints, and even if we don't agree with it, we can just take it and treat them with kindness. I think that's really, really important. It's even more important for uh, the youth because they're going through a phase where they're trying to figure out who they are and their beliefs and what, what, uh, what, where, they, where their opinions are. And I think it's just really important for youth uh, to have a safe place to be able to voice their opinions and not feel attacked or uh, not have a negative reaction to the things that they say, but instead uh, have a safe environment to be able to be vocal about the things they believe in. So calm, Luca. Yeah, in addition, I would just like to add that the students who are being bullied, what action are the authorities taking? Is it very strict so that it not, does not continue because there are students who are so scared that they are committing suicide? And it's very heart-wrenching when I read news about that. So it's very important that certain regulations should be in place so that students who are bullied, you know, they are able to approach the authorities and have their grievances addressed. And are the, do you, any of you have examples of that actually happening in East Brunswick? No, it did not happen. It happened in New Brunswick. Uh -huh. It's so close to East Brunswick. And uh, so, you know, they, the roommate had, you know, taken pictures of this uh, uh, boy. And then, you know, he was so embarrassed that he was being made fun of. He went and jumped in the lake and lost his life. And, uh, you know, we should not just read it like a news, something news. It should be, something very uh, serious so that such things are not repeated. People, students are taking it as a joke. It, it should not be taken as a joke. That's my concern. Innocent lives are being lost. And uh, that is not how, you know, the schools or the colleges, you know, should be, uh, you know, regulated. So several of you have focused on youth and safe, yes. and safe spaces. Does, do, does anybody want to jump in here and talk more about your, your aspirations and, and why you're focusing more on youth? You haven't talked as much about adult interactions. I can 
I can add to that. Um, the youth are our future, and if we don't uh, invest in uh, in, toler in tolerance uh, and acceptance uh, in our youth, uh, then we're in trouble. Um, and I think that's probably why youth is on everybody's mind. Um, you know, we need to expand this type of education um, and um, drive home, um, you know, the consequences of the opposite of being tolerant. Uh, what, what can that lead to? It's not just, uh, uh, it's like commonly said, it's not just a, it's not a joke. It's not just some comment. Um, you know, we all know racism can lead to, to horrific uh, acts. Uh, we, we've seen it in history. So um, we should never downplay any type of, uh, you know, racism um, and invest uh, in, um, you know, bias education, um, Holocaust and genocide education, uh, all of this is key uh, to make sure that our youth grows up, uh, grow up uh, uh, differently. I, I sadly differently than maybe my I don't know, my generation uh, might have grown up. Anybody else want to jump in here? Go ahead. So yeah, so what I would like to add it is true. I mean, I did focus on youth and you know younger adults, but I think it's equally applicable to people of all generations. So, um, you know, uh, I mean, uh, myself, you know, I, since I've traveled uh, all over the world, I've lived most of my life outside of my country. So I've come in contact with all races, ethnicities, I've, 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 you know, so it has really groomed me and I find it very easy to be able to relate to anybody that's on, you know, on this call today. However, you know, everybody has different experiences. So I feel that the youth don't get the full exposure to what I got, so that's my, you know, my hindsight. But uh, I'm, I'm, I might be mistaken. I think uh, some, in some cases, kids are actually more adaptable and more, more, you know, welcoming of everybody else than maybe we might think. So, I sometimes I'm very uh, optimistic. I feel that they have, being here in East Brunswick and generally being here in this, uh, you know, in this area, they have the capability sometimes to even uh, you know, to, to weather more than, you know, maybe we think they can. So I'm, I'm always optimistic. Niha, go ahead. I completely agree with what both Dan and Mohammed said. And I think the importance of youth is just that, yes, they are our future, but they're also the easiest to change. They're most adaptable to change, um, children are. And I think it's also important to note that a lot of systemic change starts in our education systems. And that includes being seen in your history books and feeling identified. And a lot of the history we'll, we learn is only one version of it taught by the victors. Um, and specifically, I think people of color and people who identify as LGBTQ plus need to see themselves in our history books. And that's a good place to start. So somebody else wanted to jump in? Yeah, I just wanted to add that. Um, so I, I was actually speaking to a couple of the youth at my church and just asking them like um, what they thought of, of a similar question to the one we were talking about right now. And they mentioned that at times that um, they feel intimidated um, to speak up about certain beliefs or to speak up about certain things because they're afraid of the reaction that they'll get or they're afraid of being attacked. And for a child or a youth um, to, to be intimidated to speak in a country with free speech, it just breaks my heart that, that that's the world we're living in today. And I just hope that we can change that, at least in our community, so that these children are able to express themselves. So that's, um, I also would like to uh, say that I agree with everything that um, my fellow colleagues in this uh, event have said. Um, and yeah, I would just like to add that one part. So Susanna. Yeah, and I, I, I um, you know, I agree with, you know, everything that was said as far as youth is concerned. You know, youth is important. They're our future. They're most impressionable. You know, just um, the, the point at which, you um, you know, we can we can help them to maintain an open mind because when you're born, you're born without biases. And how can we help them maintain that open mind? Certainly, it starts 
at home and, you know, what support can we give to families to help them uh, to, you know, provide an environment that, um, you know, will help them to raise children with, you know, open, open mind and open perspectives. Uh, and also support through programs, whether it's community programs, school programs, programs to help um, bring, you know, parents and families together into discussions like this. And oftentimes, you know, with Human Relations Council, we have discussions like this often. And sometimes we say, well, gee, you know, we're all talking to the folks that are kind of, we're preaching to the choir. Um, but I think each time if we bring one person along, if we just bring one person along, if we've just influenced one person today, I think we've come a long way. So thank you for putting on a program like this. So not seeing any other hands, why don't we move to the next question? Because this will, we've, we've a sense now of what our aspirations for the community is, but or are, what is keeping us from having the kind of community that you want for yourselves, your families, and others in your community? What kind of challenges are you facing in reaching the aspirations you talked about? Uh, uh, Naveen. <laughs> and then Su Susanna, I think I saw her. Yeah. So go ahead. I I think one aspect that's holding us back is stereotypes. I think a lot of times before we even have a conversation with someone, we already have made up our minds about them. And um, for example, we might think that because a person is of a certain religious background, that they're intolerant or um, that there's no way they'll ever, we'll ever um, agree with them or we can ever be friends because we're always just gonna disagree and butt heads. But that's not true. You may hold different views, but it doesn't mean you can't be friends and you can't listen to that conversation. So I think stereotypes are a big thing. Um, I think maybe if we can just uh, be open-minded and choose to have a conversation before we've made up our minds, I think that would help greatly. Do you have any examples of how that's played out? Yeah, so there, <laughs> yeah, there's, um, there's a couple. I can only speak for my community, of course. Uh, I'll let... Um, the other members speak for theirs. Um, for In terms of my community, I think being a Christian and a Coptic Orthodox Christian, um, we're oftentimes viewed as intolerant because um, we're viewed as, oh, Christians don't believe in this and that, and therefore they don't like people that practice these things or that, um, you know, believe in these, in these things. So at times we are viewed as harsh and, um, and like, we might hate people that that do that do certain things we may not agree with, and that's not the case at all. We preach tolerance, we preach kindness, and in fact, we teach our youth. Like St. Mary's Church in East Brunswick has thousands of youth that attend uh, regularly, and and we're constantly teaching them love and tolerance and acceptance of people that are different. And um, and so that's not the case at all. And if someone were to just have a conversation, they would immediately see that but you know sometimes we don't even have that first conversation which is why an event like this is so important because i feel like we need more of this throughout our community so this idea of getting to know each other better perhaps yes yeah, yeah. <laughs> you know, what we call bridge uh to different parts of our community so i think susanna was next right yeah, and I, I was actually going to say there's nothing keeping us from having the community we want. You know, I think that's up to us to make it happen and make this the community that, um, you know, that, that we want to live in. And, and I've been here 25 years. I haven't left. And it's because it is the community I want to live in. So, so there's nothing keeping us from that. But, but what we have to do is keep mo moving forward. I, I do think that um, this is a wonderful community to live in, um, but, but there's always room to get better. And, and I know, you know, as far as these, these kind of forums and these discussions, you know, uh, through, through joining various committees, I would encourage anyone who's watching who's interested, get involved in the various um, organizations and committees. Through Human Relations Council, I've met so many wonderful people. I've had the opportunity to, you know, go to people's homes that I normally wouldn't have gone to. And uh, I made friends that, 
you know, I, I would not have met otherwise. So there's nothing keeping us from being the community we want. We just have to take it into our own hands. So, Kim Liu. Yeah, I belong to the East Brunswick Senior Center. Mm -hmm. And every year we used to celebrate Heritage Day. So people, you know, from different uh, parts of the world, they were given one day to bring their artifacts and their snacks or whatever food to share with the other people and let them educate them about their culture. And this, you know, is a really good way, you know, of educating the people because everybody doesn't travel all over the world. So you're bringing, you know, some glimpse, you know, from our background to introduce you our clothing, our fashions, our food. And uh, it's very interesting how we can bring people together. Now, I do not know whether something like this could go with the youth, with the children at school, some kind of a program where, you know, they could uh, bring something at a smaller scale like that so that the uh, children are educated. Because even uh, if you see Channel 7 on TV it, at 6.30, they say world news tonight. What world news? He's talking only about America. America is not the world. So I'm trying to say is that people who are students who are coming from different cultures, different backgrounds, if they are given an opportunity to have a day to celebrate and share their ideas, their views, it would uh, help a lot and remove the ignorance. There's a lot of children over here who are born, they have no idea. And uh, people who are coming from other countries, they are speaking more than one language. So it's not that just because they are weak in English that they are dumb or they are stupid. It's just that they have to cross that barrier. So it's very important to share each other's culture and ideas and show them and educate them so you can bring them closer together. You get a newfound respect. So we heard earlier about the many languages spoken in your yes. community. So language sounds like it, it can be a barrier though. Yes. To finding ways to connect if people yes. don't have that common language yes. to, in, to exchange. Yeah, but so. if you bring your clothing, your fashions and your food and you know, let them share your culture, you show them, you know, that these are the festivals during the year that we celebrate. Like all we know over here is Thanksgiving and Christmas. What about the other festivals? Like we have something similar to Halloween. We put color during spring festival. We put different powdered colored powder uh, to welcome spring. So then, you know, people understand that, you know, this is something to celebrate, you know, flowers and birds in the springtime and uh, the, the, what is called, uh, these are crops, some of them, you know, they are growing. Different colored flowers are there. You're welcoming nature. So if you're welcoming nature, what about the people? They are coming in different colors. So everybody is a human, but there is a soul behind it. It's just outside that you are getting distracted that this one is a thin person or a fat person, or this is fair person, uh, you know, dark person doesn't mean that because person is dark that he is uh, not good enough or somebody who is fair or white that he is the best, he is the supreme. Who decided that white is right? Who decided? We have to go behind, you know, and see, you know, what, what are our background, what we are thinking, we exchange ideas. That's how, you know, we can come closer together to know where we are coming from. Sometimes uh, we may not express ourselves clearly and uh, not because that uh, we, uh, you know, saying something incorrect, but we are not able to express because English is a second language. So people have to, you know, uh, understand the difficulty that we are facing. You come to a foreign country and all of a sudden you have a culture shock, you know. So you're dealing with this, you're going to the supermarket and your parents tell you go get a milk. You don't know which milk to get, such a big variety of milk. We didn't come from our country where we had a big variety. So we are dealing with all these difficulties 
and then on top of that you know you have people who are just born here and they think that you know they are no at all so that's all that they know so christy jump in and then neha what i have to say um isn't uh similar to that i what what i want to say is that i feel like the work of, I say, diversity, equity, equity, and inclusion is just really difficult work. It's just very hard. Um, and um, one of the things I teach a class called Religious Radicals here, and we've been talking about leaders of justice movements and different current events. And it has been a difficult class because my students all have different varying opinions and they haven't, you know, had um, outside of their, you know, social media and online face to face conversation about these things. And some have pulled out of the class and I've said to them, this is going to be difficult work. It's going to be a, a difficult journey before we get to the goodness you have to you know, deal with some of the, the, the frustrations behind having differing opinions or, you know, just sitting in the discomfort of it. Um, and so I think, I think the work of becoming a more diverse and equitable community, it, it's beautiful, but it's not all feel good work. Um, and it, you know, it takes hearing things that you, not just that you disagree with, but that are painful, you know, like, um, the first time I was called the N-word was on the playground at Frost Elementary School. You know, those are the types of things that need to be said. Now, granted, I love East Brunswick. You know what I mean? Like that was a long time. That was a lot, not just a long time ago, but um, it's a part of my experience. I had wonderful experiences in East Brunswick too, but also had some not so great ones. And I think that needs to be acknowledged and spoken. And that is, that's difficult to say. And it's also difficult to hear. But then the question becomes um, even more is, are any of our kids now experiencing the same thing? And if so, how, how, do, we work, how do we work out of that? You know? And so that's really what I wanted to say that it's, it's muddy, I call it like sort of quicksand work, but you can really get to the beauty once you get through some of, some of that discomfort. But we really have to acknowledge the fact that it is uncomfortable first um, before we really can make any progress. So Neha, jump in. Yeah, so I just wanted to touch on um, two of the things we've been talking about. First, with what Christy's saying, I completely agree. And it's part of what's very difficult about change is it's uncomfortable and it's especially uncomfortable if it's not necessarily what you believe serves you. And that doesn't mean it doesn't serve our community as a whole. And I think that's very important to remember is that um, increasing visibility for somebody else is just as important as something that you might care about. Um, and that's where it becomes political. And unfortunately, I think we lose a lot because um, activist movements are hard. And um, specifically, like even in, in school, when, when you're trying to be seen, I think it's very important that um, you're recognized for that. Um, and it's not just said that necessarily um, what you're doing is important, but it's not as important as this. Um, and I think that does happen a lot is that we agree with you, but this is more important. And, and I do think that's, that's part of the difficulty. Um, on another point to what Kamala was saying, I do think that East Brunswick in particular does a very good job of celebrating um, a lot of the different cultures we see here. We do have, um, I know through the middle school and the high school, um, international days and, and clubs that um, host events specifically so students can feel represented and experience other cultures. And I think those are some of the best um, events I've actually attended at the high school. And it is very much a community of enjoyment and experience and fun and learning about people um, that you might not have, have known about before. And, and I do let, like that a lot. And I think that's something that we do very well. So Dan and then Mohammed. Uh, I'll just be very brief. Um, one of the things that I, I do like about, or one of the surprises I like about the different uh, uh, languages and uh, the diverse cultures, that sometimes you actually find things in common. Um, you know, for example, me living in the Middle East for 20 plus years, I guarantee you, uh, I guarantee that Muhammad and I can sit and have a great cup of coffee that we both enjoy uh, that's from the Middle East without assuming, but you know, um, or, or Arabic and Hebrew, some of it's very similar. And I've, I've found uh, uh, myself having great conversations with, um, you know, Arabic speaking parents in, in the charter school where my child 
uh, when my children learn, we suddenly realize how many words we have in common, uh, the foods we, we, we like are very similar. So <clears throat> breaking bread, although we can't do it now uh, because of COVID, but once we're able to do it, um, a very good first and simple step is to just sit down and have a, a cup of coffee or, or you know, break bread as they say. Um, and that leads to very good conversation. Um, so hopefully when the pandemic ends at some point in our lifetime, uh, we can uh, yeah. go back to doing that. <laughs> So, so I think you brought up a really interesting uh, topic that we'll get into a little bit more is that idea of how can we find what we have in common? You know, we know a lot about our differences, but, you know, emphasizing and, and several of you really talked about what we also have in common. And for all of us, this is uncomfortable to be around people that are different from us, but also a celebration to do it. So bridging that discomfort level and jumping in and finding that it's it's something that's very welcoming and 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 can I think what was the term? This is a huge part of my, of my professional life. I'll just add this is a huge part of my professional life as well. Bridging the communities. It's super important. You say that again? Part of my professional, in my professional world, this is a lot of what the Jewish Federation does is bridging. Uh, bridging. We, we try to reach out to anybody that's willing to sit down and talk and, and, and work with us together. So, Mohammed, you've already now breaking bread across my screen. <laughs> so, come in and tell us uh, your thinking on this. Sure. So, I would agree that we tend to. Um, follow the stereotypes and, you know, that's totally uh, unacceptable. There's another word sometimes used, you know, it's called collective blame. We need to eliminate collective blame and look beyond the stereotypes. And, uh, you know, I'm guilty of that myself and I, and I strive to, you know, to, to make myself better. So I'll give some, you know, real examples. When we moved to um, East Brunswick um, 16 years ago, we didn't know anybody in, in the town. So my wife, she, she grew up here all her life. She bought some cakes and we went individually to all the neighbors around us, to the left, to the right, to the front and to the back. And, you know, uh, we sat down with them, introduced ourselves, kind of, you know, break the ice. And I think these personal relationships go a long way. And now today, 16 years later, um, my daughters, they babysit uh, the kids who are around us. A um, few, few years ago in winter, um, we were, it was snowing, you know, really hard and we were sitting eating dinner and we noticed that somebody has just cleaned our walkway and they were on our driveway cleaning my driveway and I didn't know who that person was. So I walked out and I shook hands with him. I didn't know that person. He was three or four houses down me. And, you know, this is how East Brunswick is it's really impressed me. So, you know, just, you know, to, to you know, a reminder to myself, we need to build interpersonal relationship ourselves. We need to start ourselves first and, you know, try to, to, uh, to not have preconceived notions and, you know, start with a, with a, you know, a, a clean slate. And most, most often than not, we will find that everybody else is just like us. There's no difference between us. So who hasn't spoken that wants to? Uh, has everybody jumped in on this one? We'll go back to Kamlu. I just wanted to add that this social distancing has not stopped some of our people in the neighborhood from getting to know each other because some of them are working from home. So in their lunch hour, they are taking a walk and getting to know their neighbors. And it's like a real blessing to me because I you know, came to know so many new neighbors. They just walk across the street and come and talk to you. So even social distancing has not stopped people, you know, uh, from getting to know people from different cultures, getting to know how you live, walk, talk, what kind of help you need. It's a real blessing. I, I think it's like a miracle because I have seen so much wonders happening during this pandemic time when we are at home on lockdown. So many Zoom meetings and so many musicians from different parts of the world they are offering free concerts. I'm so busy on that Zoom. Sometimes people say, why are you so quiet? We didn't hear from you. I said, leave me alone. I'm so busy enjoying myself. 
<laughs> you know, and so many new things you can learn at home on YouTube and uh, learn to, you know, uh, economize, not to cook too much and how to cook less uh, with less effort. It's, it's a real blessing. If you see it, not everything is bad during this time. You is a chance for you to improve yourself from yesterday instead of comparing yourself with other people. Compare yourself from what you were yesterday. And this way you can progress. So each person on their own, if they monitor themselves, the community will take care of itself. Are your neighborhoods fairly integrated or are they more... Um segregated as far as ethnic. I have uh, I have Chinese American Italians Irish uh, Philippines uh, somebody from uh, what it is called uh, this uh, England and uh, Scotland very nice neighbors if they go to get their prescription they phone me from there do you need anything can I bring you anything I don't even ask anybody for help but just see in the back of their mind, they have that concern, that regard. Ask her if she needs, we are already here at the store. Do you need anything? I mean, such a beautiful people. They are my neighborhood, so nice. It's a, it's a blessing. So are others finding that just neighbor to neighbor that they have pretty bond yes. relationships? Yes. And uh, we have that on the internet, you know, Lawrence Brook Manor, like uh, it's an online uh, group uh, you can meet uh, and anybody needs help, you know, uh, like uh, get your door fixed or a window fixed or a, some something they want to sell. They all put in that thing uh, in that group. So you get to know so many people, you know, from like 10 miles away, you get to know them. And then they'll say, I want to sell this plant for $5. If you want, come pick it up. You can make so many connections just to is that pretty typical for the rest of you that you find that it's very easy to meet people that are not like you in East Brunswick? The, the only thing is you have to be computer savvy. So some of them, you know, they are not uh, computer savvy, so they don't know how to go on Zoom. How, how about other perspectives? Does anybody have a I different have background? Well, that's Susanna. Yeah, I, I think that... Um, you know, there, there's a natural tendency to surround yourself with people who are like you and, and you share a common language, you share common food. So, you know, many of my friends are Chinese Americans. Um, we speak Chinese when we're together, we, we eat Chinese food. Um, and that's, that's very natural. So um, I find that you do have to make some extra effort to, to meet and spend time with people that are not like you. And, and it's not, it's not wrong to, you know, to want to be around people that you can speak a different language to and, you know, who, who will, you know, eat, eat food a certain way. So, so that's okay. But you also want to share that culture because it's very rich, right? And, and both ways. And um, some, of, some of the best times I have are with people that, you know, I, I, you know I, I've never had uh, certain types of food and you go to somebody's house and it's such a blessing and such a joy to whether it's Indian food, uh, when my daughter brings home food from her friend's house and it's just, you know, you know, just such a joy to be able to have friends and connections that, that are different. And one of the things I, I love about um, this area in general is all the different kinds of food that you can have access to that, that itself, you don't have to travel. You don't have to spend thousands of dollars on airfare. Get, get in your car and you go to a restaurant and you can go to the Mediterranean, to Greece, to, to India, to China. So, you know, there's so many things you can do just by sampling food. Yes, go ahead, Neville. Um, so I would like to say that I agree with Susanna. Um, I would have to say that we do surround ourselves with people that are like-minded and are of a similar culture to us. Um, and that we do have to take extra steps to make sure we do surround ourselves with individuals that are different from us. And um, I think a great way to do it is through volunteering in the community. I find that, that actually uh, you're helping other people within the community as well as meeting and uh, 
and getting to know other people. So that's really important. And um, I have to say that Eastbound does a great job of planning events. We have the Relay for Life, uh, which our church has been involved in. And I feel like that helps us connect with the rest of the community. We had, we recently had a blood drive actually at our church. And uh, that was amazing to see members of the community come out uh, to donate. So I find that volunteering is a big part of, of meeting new people and helping at the same time. So that bridges right into the next question is given what we've talked about, what are the kinds of things that could be done that would make a difference? And I see coming from our audience, um, the East Brunswick schools have a cultural day in grades one to five, which some of you alluded to. All There's a lot of attempts throughout the community, it sounds, to really um, to, to celebrate differences and it sounds like food is one of the great ways to bring people together but let's hear from from the rest of you about other ideas Niha. okay so um one of the things i wanted to touch on is the concept of diversity of thought because i think it's very easy to find common ground with people who are similar to you or maybe not even people who are similar to you, but who think a similar way. And I think it's also very important to expose yourself to a lot of different um, ways of believing and thinking. And um, one of the ways that I think we could do that is um, go back to our roots and have conversations like this and uh, making forums like this a lot more accessible to people who want to learn and want to um, go out into their communities and meet people is I think a good way to start because you can see where you might disagree with someone, but also how maybe there are five more ways where you actually do agree with them. And I think that's powerful. Christy. One way I think um, is by going to where people are. So as opposed to just inviting to events. And I think it, they all should work in concert with one another. So whether it's a conversation or an event, that's one thing, but I think people feel there, there's a different sense that you get when someone crosses that threshold over into your territory. And so, um, I mean, obviously we're in a pandemic now, but it's also something that people can do, um, I think virtually even, you know, even more if they're uncomfortable with going into actual like physical buildings, right? Um, but like, you know, if when someone would come, a friend of mine would come visit my church, you know, um, with me on a Sunday morning or something like that, that was like a big deal. So when people intentionally cross, cross that threshold into other people's spaces, they, they, they feel uh, a little bit more sense um, that the trust, I think, is the big thing. And there, there's a mistrust when, um, well, it, there can be a mistrust um, when it's just like, we're inviting you to come to our thing. So come on out, you know, um, we would love, we would love for that, you know, um, and, and that's fine, but it seems like there's like an ulterior, uh, ulterior motive sometimes. So I think there needs to be sort of a both and. So when you talk about that kind of welcoming into your space, do you, can you give examples of how that either is being done or could be done where it's not being done now throughout the community that you're, that you all treasure? Yeah, well, I've heard religious communities mentioned more than once. Um, I, um, I work, you know, even though I'm uh, ordained as a Baptist minister, I've, I've, I've worked um, at Georgetown and now here in interfaith communities and um, just to go to, um, I remember going to the, the huge mosque, I don't know, on Route 1, my mother was like, like crossing right now, but I just remember going and visiting um, with the Imam and, you know, just how like, you know, he just felt like, wow, you know, like you're, you're, you're coming in here. This is the purpose of, you know, we, we want for not just um, our own to come. We want for others to come and, and experience this. And so I think religious communities is, is one, um, you know, even if it's, like I said, virtually on, um, in, in cer certain programs like that. Um, but I think that's the only thing right now that like comes to mind. I'm sorry, it's a long work day. <laughs> um, but I know, you know, 
as opposed to seeing an event or or something, a program and saying, oh, that's for them. That's not for like me and my particular group. Um, that's sort of the automatic feel I think that people get when they when they see or hear about something. Um, you know, but instead of having that be sort of like the automatic response, then perhaps now we can start to just individually be a little bit more open um, to attending something that we wouldn't otherwise have attended um, outside of our, our, our local sort of neighbor, neighborhoods. Other ideas? Dan. One of the things we were, uh, we as in the Jewish Federation, um, were trying to do before the pandemic, um, we were able to do a little bit, but uh, pulpit exchanges, for example. Um, we had some lined up, we were only able to do one or two, and then, you know, everything changed. Um, I think that adds a lot. Uh, you learn so much uh, from whoever is coming to speak uh, in your synagogue or in your church or in your mosque, etc. cetera. Um, uh, I think it was Christy that said inviting people to your celebrations or your, you know, commemorations is uh, also another way to break down barriers. Um, one of the, uh, for me, one of the more extraordinary things I did uh, when I moved to East Brunswick was to, to go to a uh, community iftar, which is, um, you know, breakfast after Ramadan. It was great uh, uh, to be invited to something like that. Um, or, uh, you know, a um, holiday celebration, which is, uh, you know, in winter holiday celebration of Hanukkah and uh, Christmas celebrated together. Uh, you know, we have great relationships with some uh, um, churches down in Monmouth County um, and also uh, in the Metuchen area. You know, we do this together. The rabbis do it together. The interfaith councils, all of this, all of this, like Christy said, inviting one another to, you know, our own celebrations is, uh, a great way to um, to break down those those walls and barriers, and you just kind of forget about how different, you know, the 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 differences between you. It's just basically going to someone else's celebration and having a good time and talking, and that's what ends up happening, which is great. So several, you know, Susanna, go ahead. Just real quick, one of the best celebrations I've ever been to is the Interfaith Clergy Council Thanksgiving celebration. Um, and that's all pre-COVID, so hopefully they'll be able to do that again sometime soon. But it was just an amazing gathering of of all people from all places. Um, so that's just I just wanted to throw that out as a great example. And Mohammed, go ahead. So I'll address everything in a backward order because uh, it's fresh in my mind. So Susanna, you talked about the interfaith Thanksgiving service. Because of COVID, we are going to have an online service. So Holly and the team is arranging for it and you probably will hear about it fairly soon. Uh, the second thing, uh, Christy talked about the big mosque on Route 1 in South Brunswick, Manma Junction. That's the Islamic Center, Islamic Society of Central Jersey. My, they have a school as well. So my kids, all four kids went to school there. A great place, the Imam, Imam Shibli is known in the entire Central Jersey area. Uh, they do great activities. Uh, our most important prayer is Friday prayer. So a lot of uh, non-Muslims come there to listen to his sermon. Uh, very impressive. Um, I think uh, what you know Dan touched upon and Neha and Nevin. So Nevin, I've been to your Coptic church several times. I can walk to your church. That's how close I am to your church. And uh, last year in July, there was a open house and I was there and I picked up the published material, the CDs and the books. I had the meal there with my wife and I had made this a personal, you know, a commitment to myself. I've been to the two temples in East Brunswick, uh, B'nai Shalom and EBJC, and I know the, the rabbis there very well. So I think these personal connections are very important and we need to take those steps uh, sooner than later. So, you know, I, I, I think I missed a few things, but you know, these are my everyday tasks that I do and I do it, uh, you know, consistently. Um, you know, sometimes it takes a while, but um, there's no reason why we cannot find common ground and we cannot find things that are common to all of us. So, you know, I think purposely we need to make an effort to focus on things which are productive, which are common, which are, you know, um, you know, uh, affected the community and the society at large. And it's away from those fringe things that happen around us. Um, 
when there are incidents uh, of hate against the houses of worship, whether it's a mosque or a church in New Zealand or you know a temple in somewhere else in the US, we make it a point to take a note of it and condemn it. And I've been to B'nai Shalom, especially on those, those incidents because we want to show our concern as a collective community, regardless of where the incident has happened. Right. So who do you trust to take these actions? You've mentioned a lot various religious groups as key. Um, I know we representatives from the Human Relations Council. Um, these are groups in your community that you've referred to often. You've talked somewhat about the schools, although we haven't heard as many specifics about the schools as being instrumental there. Um, but can you can you mention other groups that you also trust or want to say more about the particular groups that we've already spoken about? Well, I'm not sure this is a group, uh, to be honest, but like, I, I'm not sure what it would be characterized as, but I think parents are really instrumental in, uh, in promoting diversity and fighting against bias, because at the end of the day, no matter how much you teach a child in school, their home life affects them tremendously more, because at home is where they build their foundation. So I think parents and family play a big role in, in, in promoting diversity. I think exposing your children to people of, a, of diverse backgrounds is really important. I think helping them accept other people, teaching them to be open-minded and kind and tolerant, even when they don't, dis don't necessarily agree is so important because these kids are not gonna learn it on their own. Like it, it comes from the family and it comes from the home and it's essentially the parents' responsibility to guide them to become more accepting human beings. Um, so I would say home as maybe a, a possible group. Any other ideas, Susanna? I, I, I want to second that. I mean, I, I think, you know, speaking of the schools, there are a, a large number of, of uh, wonderful programs that are at the schools to, you know, support the, the and promote, you know, diversity and, and inclusion. Um, but, but, you know, it does start at, at home and and I can just tell you you know a little just my own personal perspective is I I was more proud when you know my child came home from school one day and said you know I I stood up for a kid that was being bullied at school they were being called names and I I don't even remember what the name was that they were being called and it doesn't matter it could be anybody it could be anything um but you know my child stood up for them that was more proud to me than, you know, I, I got an A or I, you know, got, you know, whatever award or certificate. Um, and, and that's, you know, that starts at home. So, Naveen, I, uh, I agree with that, uh, with what you just said. So how each one of us has to play a role, not just our organizations. So what kind of follow-up do you want to see from this discussion? I mean, you are obviously in a community that this is an ongoing discussion. This is not the first time you've had a chance to talk about it. But what would you want to see come out of this discussion tonight? What's the next step? You know, Christy, you talked earlier about this is really hard work, but you know, there's certain pieces that have to sort of be in place and then we have other things come out of that. So can you think of what next steps you'd like to see? Personally, um, and maybe this is already being done, so I'm sort of outside in, um, sort of like identifying. So just using my own personal example, at the school, it's, it's big work. And so instead of just like biting it all off at once, I'm just, we're just sort of identifying which areas specifically are important for this year to, to focus these particular efforts on and then sort of going from there. And so if, you know, for our, for the East Brunswick community, um, if, if it is sort of narrowed down to this area, this area, you know what I mean? And then, um, tending to those areas with, with the attention 
uh, or the intention, I guess, um, if it's local communities, right? If it's sort of building up lo local neighborhoods and and um, not necessarily diversifying per se, but you know, um, sparking community and more, you know, um, sort of neighborly neighborliness with local local communities. Okay, then that's 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 one initiative, right? If it's you know schools, um, you know, I don't know, but if 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 we narrow, I think if it's narrowed down to um, specific areas, then then we can we can be intentional because another panel would be great. It'd be great if we continued um, these types of conversations. But then also, okay, so where, you know, um, where, where then will we be able to like actually go in and, and do the work reasonably during the, the season that we find ourselves in right now in the pandemic? Anybody else? Mohammed and then Naveen. So I agree, you know, that. Um, when we do these events, I've been doing this, attending these for many, many years now. And I see that, you know, there's a participation from a select um, group within the community. And, you know, um, and then, you know, we, we, go, we go out, we should have some concrete action items. I did an event uh, two years ago in East Brunswick. Um, I think it was the Interfaith Dialogue. So somebody walked up to me and, you know, said to me, Mohammed, you know, everybody who's here, already knows you know, what we are talking about and can relate to it. She said, I'm more concerned about the people that are not here. And I okay. think that's very really true. So somehow we need to continue to grow this, this culture and this community beyond you know, the folks who are you know, busy as they are. And I think uh, personal contact does make a difference. So I was reading up before you know, joining this uh, forum that the contact hypothesis does work. If you come in contact with different kind of people, you kind of build um, uh, a bond with them and find similarities between them, and you come to to you know relate with them and tolerate them. And it has worked in different scenarios. And I think um, Naveen or Neha talked about the LGBT community. And in the 1900s and in the 2000s, you know, um, since then, one of the reasons they have been, you know. Uh, you know, they have come a long way. And the reason is because they have exposed and they have become mainstream because of the dialogue that has happened over the years. And they were, they have been very successful in, you know, advocating uh, for, for the community. And I think um, there's lessons to be learned from it. And I think, you know, discussion and contact are, you know, are, are very important. So we only have a couple more minutes. Do we have some more thoughts on this particular follow-up? And it, it's not just um, what do you want to come out of the discussion, but who else needs to be at this table, which you also started to address or be at a table. Neha. I know Naveen wanted to talk, so I'll, I'll be brief, but um, I do think that it's very important uh, what Mohammed just said. And I think part of that does start in school. Home is very important, but I can also speak to experiences that people I've grown up with who have become um, more aware of things over the years just by being friends with people like me and um, people of other faiths or um, ethnic backgrounds that they would not have been exposed to despite their parents maybe being a little bit less tolerant. And I do think that part of that is the school community and, and the friendship community. And I think a good example of this is like a microcosm of that is just um, a teacher in school knowing that it was um, Navratri, which is a Hindu holiday, and saying happy Navratri, and, and then other people um, feeling seen, first of all, which is important, and then people who don't know what that is asking questions and then learning more that way. And I think um, being making an effort to be personally educated and then um, making an effort to reach out, even just by that, saying happy Eid when it is, and, and things like that um make a make a big difference to feeling that sense of community so one of the ways that some communities go about having these discussions is to break into the very go and talk to their own uh groups uh that they identify with to have the conversation i know mohammed you were talking about you know we're the people in this room are at this table often 
but it's other people who aren't in this discussion that perhaps need to be brought in. So what do you think of different ways of doing it? Would it be a good idea to have a similar conversation within your own, um, say, ethnic or religious community or racial community or whatever kind of community, gender community um, you represent? Or do you think it's important to continue to have this sort of intergroup dialogue? Sure. Dan, were you looking to jump in here? Yeah. Um, so one of the most important, it, it's unfortunate, but all of us here have, um, one thing in common, in my opinion, um, on different levels, of course, but I want to say, you know, cautiously, I think we've all been victims of racism in some way or another. Um, and um, I think we do have to uh, go back to our own communities and explain the importance of uh, these interfaith and interrace relationship building uh, because we need each other to push back on the common enemy, which is hate uh, and racism. Um, this is what, uh, and it's a difficult task because we, we all come from uh, uh, groups that have their own stereotypes and, you know, all of us here have, you know, our own prejudices and stereotypes, but, um, you know, it's unfortunate, but it, it, people seem to, to come together when uh, they're, they're threatened by the same, uh, um, you know, enemy. Um, and building alliances is pretty much the only way I think that we can uh, successfully push back and make a difference and try to eradicate uh, as best as possible, um, you know, those that uh, don't like us for whatever reason. Um, and then it's easier to go to your legislators and to your community leaders uh, as one diverse group and say, you know, we want to see this and that uh, because we're, we're tired of, 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 you know, the racism that we're seeing. Um, you know, and it doesn't always have to be negative. I mean, again, we could all we could also do the same and go back to our community and say, look, this is what we have in common with these groups. Let's let's talk about celebrating together. Let's talk about uh, you know, again, I, I know I'm repeating myself, but breaking bread together because I really do believe in that. I really do believe that something so simple as as just having a cup of coffee or a beer with somebody is is can do wonders. So yes, we do have to go back to our own communities, um, and we do have to talk about. Uh, breaking out of these uh, bubbles that um, you know some so, some of the some of us come from uh, or the communities we come from. So we're just about out of time. Any last words, single words from any of you that you want to say before we before we sign off? N Naveen. I just wanted to say that um, that's such a wonderful idea, Dan. This idea of celebrating one another. And um, I think we should take advantage of that. I know Mayor Cohen is uh, listening. So maybe we can plan some type of community event or uh, Heritage Week where we can all uh, maybe are, become more educated about each other's backgrounds and our cultures. And I think that, that would be a good start. Tom Liu. You are unmute, uh, Tom Liu. Yeah, unmute. Kamlu, we can't hear you. We still can't hear you. So you need to that. go ahead. Yeah, I wanted you to know that uh, every year we used to have unity walk uh, by the East Brunswick uh, Library Lake. And uh, that time, you know, all the different uh, groups uh, would meet and Nancy Pinkin was there, Mayor Brad Cohen was there. But this year, because of this uh, pandemic, we were not able to do it. And uh, that also brings the whole community together and we get chance to meet with other people from different communities. Susanna, you get the last so, word because we're really out of time. Well, yes. it was just to actually, um, to say to Kevin Lou, you will not be disappointed. There will be a unity walk this year, although it will be a, a, a virtual one. Um, I believe the date, I don't want to give you the wrong date, but I think November 12th, but please check the East Brunswick Human Relations Council Facebook page. We'll be posting information about that unity walk. You'll be encouraged okay. uh, to send in 15 second videos. Please uh, take a look, look for it. It'll be coming up soon. Okay. So, so I'm afraid we're on cut you all off, but I want to thank you. It's been just such a pleasure and a privilege to moderate this discussion today and to, to be part of your world. So 
thank you all so much for your candid and insightful thoughts. And I'm gonna turn it back over to Christine who will close out and tell you what's next. Thank you so much, Nancy. And thank you all for joining and being a part of this discussion on how important it is for us all to come together, get to know each other better so that we can come together against bias. We have a special thanks to our panelists for sharing uh, your experiences, your insights, and your views. We also want to thank our wonderful coordinators, Sandy Landman uh, and her committee, Linda Rifkin, Gail Honig, and Holly Cerami. Special thanks to you, Nancy, our Nancy Chronic, our moderator, did a great job. And we're very grateful to the Human Relations Council, especially uh, for partnering with East Brunswick Hadassah. And a big shout out to Holly Sarami for being such uh, an important part of this program. Uh, and we are very grateful to the East Brunswick Library, Melissa's, Melissa Kussman and Melissa Holzik, who put on this program. The technology is challenging. Thank you so much for doing it. And please watch for upcoming more bridge building programs from the East Brunswick chapter of Hadassah and the Human Relations Council. Uh, watch our Facebook pages and our websites. We hope that this discussion has set the stage for more events to advance the extraordinary potential of our diverse community. Thank you and good night. Thank you so much. Thank you for joining us for this week's Encore presentation. To join us for live programs or to learn more about the East Brunswick Public Library, visit our website at ebpl.org.